Hello, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today. I'm joined by Dr. Paul Brewerton, uh, who is the founder of StrengthScope. And, um, and in all of our preparation for this, I've found every time we've chatted, it's been a little bit different, but always fascinating. So uh, a huge welcome to you, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Francis. And uh, one, one little thing I learned about Paul is in terms of resilience, uh, you've done some kind of ultra marathon or something. Tell us yeah, about that. Yeah, it's going back away, but it is true. Yes. Uh, once upon a four years ago, I decided, um, I don't know whether mistakenly or not, but anyway, it happened that <laughs> I liked two cities in particular in the world, London and Brighton. And I understood that you could bike between the two, but also run between the two. So I signed up with a colleague from uh, from Strengthscope to, to do just that. And uh, yeah, resilience was required, let me tell you. But, but re relating to what I think we'll be talking about today, definitely drew on some strengths to get there. Um, my, probably my signature strength is collaboration. Right. And that was actually the first thing. When I made this decision, I'm going to do this thing. The first yeah. thing I thought of was, how can I get someone else on board with me? How can I collaborate with someone so we've got a goal together that we can work towards? Um, and I did just that, you know, and actually as we were going through the process and it was getting longer and longer and more and more difficult, <clears throat> broadening that sense of collaboration to involve the whole StrengthsGoat team who were all on a WhatsApp feed. Um, oh, really, I mean, it, I wouldn't say it helped. I think without that, probably we wouldn't have made it. It was uh, amazing to have that level of social support all the way through. Brilliant. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, hopefully today won't be such a challenge for you, but um, in a way, I really wish I'd had this conversation 30 years ago uh, because I've come from a, a background and a culture where you're always focused on your weaknesses and how to improve your weaknesses. And of course, I developed my own strategy of uh, dealing with um, difficult situations, which largely involved um, sucking it up and carrying on, just keep pushing, keep pushing, and maybe have a stress ball or two handy. But but when when we went through this and, and the work that we've done with our clients and hearing about the work you've done with your clients, what a super way of actually um, helping people understand how to build resilience. And so I'm very excited today. We've built the talk around four key questions, which you can see there, but you really need to stay on until the very end because there's an opportunity for you to put your questions in the chat box uh, that you can see on your screen. We'll be collecting those. And at the end of this time, which there should be, we'll be asking Paul those questions. Um, and any that we don't answer, we will put into a Q&A pack that we'll send out afterwards. And talking about afterwards, there's two things at the end. One is a very special offer that we're going to make uh, to everybody who joins this webinar today and stays to the end. And the second is a gift. So um, stay tuned. I uh, hope you've got your pen and pencil ready and let's start. So let's start right at the very beginning, Paul, in terms of, well, how do you identify your strengths and having identified them, how do you develop them? Yeah, it's a really important, well, it's the fundamental question really, isn't it? it? And I think if you ask someone what your strengths are and they've not been through any kind of, you know, formal assessment, they'll probably be talking about the skills areas. You know, they'll probably be talking about things that they're comfortable talking about because they're recognised in those areas of skill. We, at Strengthscope, we, um, we define strengths differently. We talk about strengths being those qualities that energise you and that you're either great at or have the potential to become great at. So there is a skill component in there, but fundamentally for us, strengths are about energizers. What are the things that we love that we're passionate about? So I've got two answers to the question. The first is my kind of recommended approach, which um, involves you taking some kind of assessment, ideally one that is valid, reliable, has some kind of certification, uh, to attest to that, uh, which is accessible. And if you're using it at work, and most of them are kind of work-based, uh, you know, something which is going to be business relevant and use language that people will be comfortable uh, with. So that would be my 
preferred approach. In lieu of that, <clears throat> if you don't have access to such an assessment, which can help build a very um, kind of common language, if you like, a framework that everyone can have a conversation around uh, their strengths with, then simply asking the question of yourself, when were you last at your best? You know, what were you doing? What were people doing and saying around you? What outcomes did you achieve? What happened for you? That can be a good starter, you know, and uh, particularly if you get a group of people together asking that question of each other in twos or threes, you get real energy going where people start talking about perhaps their passions. Um, probably strengths will be in there as well, even if how, they're not talking about them in that way. How easy is it to get that conversation going? You know, I setting the circle with saying, tell me what my strengths are. Are people open like that? Or? Yeah, absolutely, perfectly. I mean, that's just such a, it, it, you, you've got it right there. So we don't ask that question. We ask right. people, um, when were you last at your best? What were you doing? You know, when were you really enjoying your work? When were you in flow last? You know, those are the kinds of questions that enable people almost to bypass any discomfort they might sense from talking about or owning strengths. Because if you're owning strengths, then maybe you might fail at some point, you know, and that, that in itself represents a challenge which, which we can talk a little bit more about. Um, so we asked the question, which is more to do with energy, more to do with passion, enthusiasm, drive, motivation, and that gets people talking. You're right, again, though, initially when people start to have that conversation, it can be a little bit reserved. And what I've seen time and time again in workshops where you've got a, a group of people in the room, could be 10, it could be 100, um, the energy starts to rise in the room as the conversation unfolds. So people get into flow when they see that it's okay to talk about what they love. And then you start to feel that energy. Um, yeah, I remember a particular time we did this work workshop, it was in um, Adelaide in Australia. <clears throat> we were in a room with the door open to allow latecomers to come in. And uh, we were, I think, on the seventh floor, but there was like an open atrium, you know, and people who were coming in late said that they didn't need to ask reception where the workshop was, because they could hear where it was happening. It was that loud. The energy was, was really positive, And it wasn't just because we were in Australia. Um, you know, it, it just it just yeah. felt um, incredible to just be part of it. It's the same with every every time we run that as a little exercise. You have the same sense that people are, start off a little bit slowly and then they warm up and then they're in flow. Um, and that yeah. really is when they're probably starting to key into strength areas that they're talking about. But I guess, is it, do people then need help to pin that to some kind of framework? Or does yeah, it just... I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. And so in those workshops, we'll typically introduce Strengthscope at some point, even if people haven't completed it. Uh, we'll talk about the 24 strengths that are included in, in the model, which we'll maybe um, see a little bit later on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in, in doing that, uh, people do, they can start to label just by looking at the, um, the descriptions of the strengths. Actually, that's probably what was happening for me there. It was relationship building. Oh, I love meeting new people. Or, yeah, I was in planning mode there. Um, that might be an efficiency strength or I was getting over the line with something that was actually quite challenging So maybe that's resilience and results focus. You know, these are some of the strengths that we include in Strengthscope So you can bring it back to a conversation around the framework Ideally, you'd want to take an approach which is validated. So you've got something um, Against which you can uh, compare, you know, you can compare against other people And you can make sure that actually what you're looking at is an accurate representation of you Validated? Well, there's a question. There's a word. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and, and potentially a question with it. Yeah, no, so it's true. Gonna, yeah. But you've said it so twice. I just picked, wanted to know what you mean by that. Yeah. So, valid and reliable are the two touchstones, if you like, of psychometricians. Um, so, the people who build psychometric tools. And in order for something to be valid, it needs to essentially measure what it purports to measure. Um, so if you've got 24 strengths in Strengthscope, you would want those to independently assess what they say they assess in a way which is reliable as well. So time after time, you're going to get the same set of results happening. So over time and internally, you need to have reliability and validity. It can be measured in different ways. The British Psychological Society um, lay out a very stringent set of benchmarks that you need to achieve if you're to uh, gain the test registration certificate from that organization which is seen pretty much as a global gold standard it's what 
other um, European psychological associations follow as well. <clears throat> Well and I'm very okay. happy to say there is only one strength assessment in the world that has that um, that that certificate, that certification, that test registration, and it's StrengthScape. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. So I, I want to stop talking about strengths just for a second. Um, we're going to come back to developing them, but you know I've been brought up not focusing on my strengths, focusing on my weaknesses. And you know I thank my PE teacher, Mr. Warner, for telling me in my school report that Francis will never make the Olympics. So I just tried harder, and but I never made the Olympics. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about what are the benefits of working on your strengths compared to working on your uh, weaknesses? Yeah, there's so much in there with, with that example you gave. Uh, there's uh, a lady called Carol Dweck, I don't know if you've come across her, but she talks about um, fixed mindset versus growth mindset and she also talks about schooling as being such an important environment where people kids you know learn to either become fixed in the way that they're approaching problems and tasks because they want to protect their level of attainment or growth where they're willing to take risks push themselves and go to the next level the approach your PE teacher took was risky because it could have led you to take a fixed mindset approach and say Actually, I'm probably, you're probably right. I'm probably never going to achieve whatever it is that I want to do Olympics wise. So I'll, I'll give up. Or it could have caused you to actually say, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to get around it somehow. I'm going to maybe even use my strengths in order to, um, you know, to, to, to achieve that. Dweck talks about how a particular school she was working with were using a report card. Report cards are the classic example. You know, people, they don't, you never focus on your, um, A's and B's, you only ever focus on your C's and D's. Um, you know, that's the areas that you need to fix because they're not working as well as they should. And that's the same, by the way, the world over. She, she said this school had moved away from using the term fail or failing to describe a pupil or a student in a particular area of study. Instead, what they would include on the report card is the phrase, not yet. Ah, so yeah. Describe yeah. someone who's an F or an E or a D student, what they're saying is you've not yet attained the standard we're looking for, not that you can't or you know you won't, but not yet. That yeah. creates the sense of possibility that for most people would stimulate that move towards positive and strengths and actually what do I have, what qualities can I bring that will enable me to overcome challenge. So you're absolutely right, negativity bias as we, as we call it is all around us, it's everywhere, it's what we are socialized into. Um, it's probably evolutionary. So it goes back, you know, mm -hmm. since the beginning for humankind. And it does represent a real headwind that we have to face into. If we're to say, no, I want to focus on the things that make me uh, a uniquely positive contributor, you know, something which I can bring that nobody else has. What are those qualities that I can own, develop and master in order to be my best in order to be authentically me but in a way which is different from everybody else because mm. negativity bias says no 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 fix your weaknesses because if you fix your weaknesses you're going to be successful no you're not you're just not going to fail these are different yeah. things entirely oh i see you put the the I'll boat, boat for you. yeah yeah thanks Francis. well this is a really good example actually <clears throat> so if you have a weakness if you have something that's a shortcoming that you feel is getting in the way of your performance that, you know, if you use the analogy of the boat, would be a hole beneath the waterline. It's something that potentially would sink your boat if you didn't address it. And that is, you know, absolutely worth spending time on developmentally. And most people have actually, by the time they get into their early careers, they're already familiar enough with these weaker areas because they've been told a few times and they've probably dealt with them, you know, the, the big hulking holes in the boat. Trouble is, for most people and most organizations, there remains a focus on the holes above the waterline, developmentally, that goes far beyond where it's useful. So, you know, the hole above the waterline might be a, a shortcoming or weaker area that I have, but it's not really affecting my performance. It's not role relevant. It's not that important for me to get good performance from myself. And yet there I spend almost all of my other developmental energy fixing and patching up the boat. Yeah. What I'm doing is making it look prettier. I'm not actually helping put wind in the sails, which is where your, your strengths can come in, because the wind in your sails will guide you from A to B, just as your strengths will do. 
if you learn to harness that energy and guide it in a direction which is positive for you. So we, we use this analogy all the time. Um, you can kind of take it even further as an analogy, which we won't, um, but you know, in its simple form, it's really yeah. about just not bothering so much, not putting so much emphasis on the holes above the water line. Ask yourself are they really relevant those weaker areas for you. Excellent. So so we're gonna forget the holes above the water line and we're gonna develop our strengths, okay? And I, yeah. forgive me everyone, I'm gonna go backwards and forwards here, but um yeah so um we're now we, we buy it we're not going to focus on the weaknesses that are not actually going to sink us and we're going to focus on the strengths how do we develop our strengths yeah developing strength starts with acknowledgement that they are things that make you you and that they're qualities which not necessarily everyone else has and that you've you've acknowledged that to a point where you recognize that you can't have you've got 24 strengths in strength scope you can't have all of them you know, and I remember in the early days with, with, with the tools we were testing it, people were struggling with that a bit. Well, I'm strong in yeah. all areas. Well, yeah, you probably, you know, you, you might be competent in all areas, that's true, from a skill point of view, but are you genuinely energized and excited by every single thing that you're seeing in that framework? Or are there some things which you, which you absolutely love um, and where if you put more energy and more emphasis and learn some skills in those areas, where you, you potentially could see mastery happening. You know, you could really start to develop in areas which are specialisms for you, which are almost part of your personal brand um, and where you can hone and develop them even further. So three ways of doing that. The first is to look for opportunities in your work life, you know, maybe a project or a team or a task where you can bring your strengths more to the fore. Um, and uh, you know, look for ways to stretch them and develop them by basically getting some experience on the job. Uh, example of that might be if I've got a strategic mindedness strength, so my energy can come from looking at the future, potential futures, um, scanning the landscape, seeing what might come over the hill. Are there opportunities for me to feed into a strategic planning session, for example, that's happening in a project team? You know, can I use that energy in order to bring some of those emergent skills for me to the fore, test them out, um, and that's, that's a way of honing and learning them, um, learning how to use them better. The second option would be to find somebody who is exceptional in the area of strength that you want to develop. You know, look for that person um, as maybe a mentor, as a coach, as a collaborator, or even just someone who you can observe, and ask yourself what it is that they're doing that perhaps you're not quite there yet, but if you did more of that, you'd get there. The third so area. Modeling, modeling yourself on them or yeah, what they exactly. do. Exactly. But you go to the degree of doing all of these, this kind of mapping and stuff that you sometimes read about. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. then the third area is uh, almost traditional learning and development. So um, getting some skill development, learning or gaining some knowledge in areas which are natural strength areas for you. Um, so that strategic mindedness strength might benefit from me doing some kind of qualification in, um, I don't know, kind of scenario planning, for example, which is very closely related to strategic mindedness strength. Or yeah. if I had an efficiency strength, which I don't, or a detail orientation strength, which I don't, then um, maybe something around project management um, training would help because that could help me hone in those areas where those natural strengths can really come to the fore. Okay, so look for opportunities, look for um, a role model, uh, and, and finally get some training in, in particular areas, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Keep going. You know, initially it can feel interestingly indulgent to be focused on your strength areas, and at the same time a little bit scary, because you're owning something which potentially you could become great at and could be known for being great at. And yeah. that brings risk because, you know, for, for many people, there's a, a concern that if I, if I attain medium levels of performance in all areas, I'm never going to be singled out as excellent in anything. You know, that's, yeah. a, that's actually, according to Dweck, a kind of fixed mindset approach where you just get to a certain level and then you're comfortable to stay there. But mm. owning your strength and taking it on to mastery and it becoming part of what you're known for initially at least can feel quite daunting 
Yeah, and I love that link to your personal brand. You know, that is that is uh, you are what you do, I guess. Um, yeah. Something famous must have said that somewhere. But um, we are what we repeatedly do. But okay, so so we focus on on the strengths and and developing them. But but tell me a bit about resilience. How do you define resilience, Paul? Yeah. I've got a preferred definition. It isn't necessarily the definition that you would see in the dictionary or that you would see maybe other psychologists using. It tends to be traditionally defined as bouncing back from challenge, um, you know, working through um, adversity and coming back to the same place that you started. My preference is to think of resilience as presenting an opportunity almost, you know, so if you, if you face challenge, can you bounce forward through the adversity? Can you learn and develop and grow through those experiences? So for me, resilience, yeah, is about bouncing back, but bouncing forward as well. Uh, you know, asking yourself, what, what can you learn from what you've just experienced, rather than just saying, phew, I'm back to where I started. Okay, so, so I love the idea of bouncing forward, but don't you need some kind of purpose behind that? If you is, is that a starting point or not really? In terms yeah, of enabling you to bounce forward, a focus, a, a direction, uh, because sometimes you, you lose some of those things, don't you, when you have yeah, a session? I, I think for me, the main focus I'm talking about in that example is, is learning, you know, is, right. is keeping your mind open to, I think it was, I, you know, we were just, we've just been quoting people over the place. I don't know, I've attributed this to Nelson Mandela, um, but I think it's probably been said by many people and possibly, or possibly not, Nelson Mandela, who knows, but I like it anyway. There is no failure, there is only learning. So, yeah. you know, the idea is that, you know, if you, and this is very much a growth mindset approach, so it's very much based on positive psychology principles. You know, if you, if you worry too much about uh, the possibility of failure or just getting back to where you were, you're not necessarily gonna use all the opportunities to move forward, learn, develop and grow uh, as you go through your career or go through challenge. And God knows, Right now, there's many challenges we're facing. I mean, you know, we're looking at the uh, the COVID crisis and the personal challenges that people are, are going through with that. Very personal as it's continuing, you know, where, where we're easing lockdown, we're starting to see, um, you know, anxiety related symptoms. Um, people are, are suffering with, with all sorts of mental health issues. Some of those hidden, some of those uh, more, more obvious. We've got an impending economic crisis uh, that the government tells us that they can they can resolve, not necessarily, um, uh, you know, believing them wholly. You know, there's there's an awful lot of uncertainty happening at the moment. So, given that, and given that changes around us and adversity is around us and will be forevermore, particularly so at the moment, how can we learn through that? Right? Because how can we come back to where we started? You know, like they yeah. just end this. So maybe an approach is to just say, well. Let's just keep learning, keep growing, not see um, inverted commas failure as that, just see it as an opportunity to learn. And that feeds directly into, into this next question, doesn't it? In terms of things that you can do to build uh, build resilience. And you talk a lot in, in, in um, your podcasts and all of these things about controlling. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there are four things I want to, talk you through here the first yeah. of those is controlling the controllables um, and doing that exceptionally well and i'll come on to that and talk about that in a second the second is around managing your mindset so taking a, a positive approach if you like um, but doing that in a way which is very specific by changing the kinds of questions uh, and the kinds of um, directions you're taking with your thinking the third is to play to strengths and it's really around strengths choice and with that choice coming a sense of empowerment, enablement and self-belief. And the fourth is around having a uh, strong support network. So ensuring that you've got people around you who can support you uh, and who uh, will help you in that sense of self-belief that you're able to, to get through tough times, you're able to learn and grow as you go. Um, so coming back to controlling the controllables, which yeah. Francis mentioned. So what has been shown is that typically in any given situation we can control about 50 percent of that situation 
50% we can't, 50% we can. It does vary a little bit depending on the situation, but on average, that is, that's, that's the way things are. What we can't control are things like COVID or the impending economic crisis or how long the queues are when we go out. Uh, although to some extent, we might be able to influence that by the timing of or where we go in order to do our shopping. Um, maybe the moods of our colleagues, for example, Although, again, we may be able to influence that to some degree uh, in the way that we respond to those people. But COVID, nah, we can't actually resolve that personally, not unless we're working uh, in, a, in a vaccines team. And even then, there are too many variables outside of our control. So the question to ask yourself is, what can you control? And if you can't control certain things, what can you do to influence them? As I've just mentioned with those examples, you know, how can you influence a situation, maybe in a slightly more roundabout way to get a, a good outcome? And if you can't control or influence something, then probably the, the most sensible alternative is to accept it. It might mean to flex in order to deal with the situation. It might just mean saying, do you know what? There's nothing I can do. And I just accept that that's the way things are. The positive part of that is controlling the controllable part. So the bits of, of that situation that you can control will be your response, you know, your perception of and your response to a situation uh, is entirely in your control. Despite what, you know, your brain may be telling you at times, you can control your response to a situation. Uh, you may well be able to control other factors because you're actually, you've been given the control of those other factors in a given situation. So remembering and excelling of what you can control and uh, looking for ways of influencing but ultimately then accepting those things that are outside your control so that's number one and and on that though that is quite a skill in itself isn't it that, that mindset that way of looking at things it, yes it's not, it doesn't always come naturally to, to people as with all these things um, you know i think with practice you can get to a point where uh, you are more able to recognize what you can and what you can't control but yeah. but you're right in you know initially that in itself is um, maybe a bit of a uh, a surprise to some people that 50 percent of what they're facing is within their control to other people and i say 50 i thought i could control 90 percent of everything that i face <laughs> well you know so, and people do have different ways of calibrating that um, yeah. The reality is you can't control all of every situation no. <clears throat> or feel responsible for all of every yeah. situation. I've got to say, within my team, I, I don't know if this is the same uh, in your team, Francis, but there's a lot of people in my team who feel incredibly responsible for their own teams um, at the performance of the company, you know, and actually that, that you can you can feel over, almost over-responsible for certain things, things that are outside your control. So, you know, I'm repeatedly saying to, to people in the team and to people I'm working with, you know, look at the things you can control, but be realistic about it. And I think it's it's just really about, you know, demonstrating that realism in, okay. in judgment. So number one is control the controllable. What yeah. was the second one? Second one is managing your mindset. So this is that, you know, taking a positive approach. Um, we've developed a, a model which we call path of possibility. Uh, where you, if you imagine this, because we haven't got a graphic for it, but there's a path which um, we've coloured in grey, uh, which is the path of limitations, we've called it. And then there's another path, which, because our logo is purple, it's purple, which we call the path of possibility. Uh, I'm right. actually only it's purple, although, you know, it's quite a nice colour anyway. Yeah, it's very sophisticated. It's great. <laughs> it's great. It looks really nice. Yeah. Um, anyway, you, so often what will happen is when we face a problem or a challenge or an issue, we will feel uh, that we need to look for what's gone wrong very quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, we, and we might get stuck in that way of thinking. We might look at who was responsible for it. Uh, it may not be us, it's blaming other people. Yeah. So you know, we ask ourselves, well, well, well what, you know, what's happened here? What, how on earth could this have happened again? All of these things are kind of almost forcing us into that negative mindset where we're looking at the limitations and the shortcomings, we're looking to apportion blame, and we can end up feeling a little bit helpless um, and disempowered in, in those situations. However, it is what it is. That is how we're feeling. That's our response sometimes. Yeah. Um, my 
encouragement is to say at some point when you're ready if you can change that way of thinking to ask a different question perhaps how have i overcome a similar situation uh, in the past and how have i done that successfully um, who can i call on for help you know in in resolving this right now what strengths might i be able to bring into play in order to overcome this particular challenge you know that's a different line of inquiry it's a different set of questions and you end up in a very different place one where you can start to see possibilities opportunities uh, you start to feel more powerful rather than yeah. powerless yeah. in the situation yeah. you've moved to the path of possibility and that can happen for individuals it can also happen in teams where there's you know perhaps there's a lot of well we're going to criticize marketing because they haven't done x y or z or we're going to criticize the sales guys because of x y and z and that's a very human response to a situation yeah. but it's still part of limitation because we're not yeah. really resolving or working with the issue we're sort of railing against it still yeah i've got a little personal favorite around changing my mindset when i feel completely stuck or that you know it's something's gone wrong or i can't do something and i just reframe it using the phrase just supposing so okay well just supposing i could sort this out what would be the first two or three things i'd need to do right now and i find that does something physically to me as well as mentally if you like it does something yeah definitely i, I think what you're probably doing there we're almost certainly doing there is you're opening up your neural pathways to accept new possibilities you know you you are changing your state you are changing your, um, your your neurology and your physiology, and all of those things then create a virtuous cycle rather than that stuck negative cycle of thinking that you see in that path of limitation. So um, managing your mindset, maybe rather than mastering your mindset, uh, I think is realistic. You know, it's, yeah. but recognizing that you are where you are, you know, and that for some time that will be okay. You know, yeah. you don't have to move away from a negative response to something immediately or avoid it feel it but recognize that that's where you are again with practice that can come great okay um and then you talked about playing to your strengths what can you do to make it better yeah so playing to strengths could be you drawing on or choosing to draw on certain strengths um in a moment of uh of crisis or a moment where you need that resilience that sense of uh, control or that sense of purpose you know reminding yourself that you have certain strengths it doesn't come naturally initially mm. uh, you know these are things that we've taken for granted for such a long time that to remember that these are tools that we can draw on that we can take with us uh, and that we can draw out and use when we need to that takes some practice it takes some learning um, so you know and it's not just yours it's others as well so so playing to your strengths and utilizing other people's strengths where we we just don't have you know the strengths at ourselves um can really help us build that resilience you know if if because you can feel isolated when you're under stress and pressure you know and kind of go within and decide that you're the one that needs to resolve everything i was talking about over responsibility you know where people feel yeah. personally they're, they're the only one i must work late to sort this thing out it's the only way rather than thinking, well, who else could I draw from? Who, who could I delegate to? Um, who else could I bring in here who has natural strengths that could really help in this situation? Um, so playing to strengths gives a sense of possibility and a sense of empowerment and enablement that without them, you wouldn't necessarily feel. Yeah, great. Um, I'm conscious of time, actually. Uh, this is always fascinating, but we're running a little behind. Um, the last point, though, very, very quickly, is about how this support network you mentioned. Yeah, OK, so I'll be quick on this. Um, support yeah. network and having a support network is very important for all sorts of mental health reasons, actually. Lots of studies have shown you'll reduce your levels of anxiety, reduce any depressive symptoms, uh, increase or improve your mood levels if you have a positive, energising network of people around you. So a group of people who can react. So avoid the mood hoovers, go towards the energizers uh, particularly when you're under pressure because that will really help you cool excellent and of course all that helps with stress identifying it overcoming it so so what do you mean by stress yes yeah, stress um, you know it can be positive it can be negative fundamentally it's a very subjective experience 
Um, even looking at that image, you know, uh, of, a, of a drummer uh, in flow, it seems, or potentially in pain, depending on how you look at it. Um, you know, it's it's a very subjective image. They all are. Some people might look at that and go, oh my, you know, like I can't imagine being in a situation where I'm performing in front of thousands of people. Um, and other people might look at that and, and say, that's the that wouldn't stress me at all. That would bring me to life. So stress is very much a subjective phenomenon. However, even though it's calibrated in a way which is unique to you, in terms of what might stress you, or what might make you feel um, you know, positive, ultimately everyone can experience stress which goes from the positive to the negative. Uh, and so that we call it you stress, that positive stress, as you can see in the graphic, the, the ideal zone, if you like, where you're moving from comfort into stretch and you're you know, you're getting more from the situation, you're primed for performance, you are, believe it or not, autonomically aroused, apologies, but correct technical term, can lead you into um, over, tipping over into something which is experienced more as strain, uh, uh, potentially it's anxiety inducing, and ultimately the physiological response that you'll have to that <clears throat> is likely to be fight, flight, or freeze. So, you know, am I gonna stand my ground? Uh, am I going to run away uh, or am I going to just be a bit of a rabbit in the headlights and, and get stuck here? All of those, again, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, you know, they're all about how we are programmed to deal with threats in our environment. And we are, you know, super triggered by um, stress situations to respond in those ways. Trouble is, if you're in fight, flight or freeze mode, <clears throat> it's going to be very difficult for you to access your prefrontal cortex, which is where you make decisions and you can rationalize the situation. Your court uh, and your limbic system actually is hijacked <clears throat> um, by uh, an emotional response. And it's therefore very difficult to think rationally. So really important to be able to work out for you what the stresses are, and then work out for you how to avoid those becoming uh, points of stress where that's likely to be the outcome for you. And it's not not straightforward. No, well, and also, I mean, looking at the zone of delusion, that's that's where your performance is still quite high. And you just uh, said at the beginning, you just keep pushing, 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 but it stops working. At some point, right. it stops working. And, right. um, and, and then, but you just keep trying and it's recognizing that. And then I guess coming back to, okay, well, what does work for me? But isn't there something about, overdoing your strengths in, in this kind of scenario? I mean, you've described it per perfectly, actually, Francis, you know, that, that description where, you know, something's going well, you're feeling really good, maybe I have an enthusiasm strength and, you know, um, people can feel that and I can feel that and I'm getting, you know, really excited by convincing other people of this great new idea or pro approach that we want to take. And then at some point, and you're right, it's so hard to tell when, but it's all about how, a strength is affecting other people rather than necessarily looking for the effect it's having on you because you know you're in potentially the zone of delusion where you're going this feels amazing everyone's loving this and they're all going whoa <laughs> oh, this guy's just too much so you know it's spotting when that's happening it's becoming agile uh, situationally aware emotionally more aware and more intelligent Fundamentally, it is about strengths intelligence here to get you yeah. to a place yeah. where you can recognize your strengths going into overdrive, where they're having unintended consequences because of the way they're impacting other people, and then having choices as to how you can deal with that happening in the moment. Um, most, uh, the, actually, the best approach that we've identified for doing that is to bring another strength into play. So rather than attempting to dial down my enthusiasm, I might go, because I'm in that heightened state, so that's quite a hard thing to do, you know, unless I'm a sort of Zen master or something, I could just go, oh, hold on, yeah. now I'm relaxed. That's hard, it's possible, it's yeah. difficult. Yeah. Um, but instead of that, if I go to empathy or compassion or another strength I might have, or developing others even, that might lead me to ask of other people, what do you think of that idea? Yeah. You know, what, what, what do we think around the table? And so I'm still in that heightened state, but I've moved my energy into a different strength. So it's um, dialing up another strength to dial down the strength in overdrive, if that makes sense. Right. Thank you. Well, 
we're going to move on quickly. I, I, I want people to see these strengths that you talk about. I think they're really important. And when you see them and you work out what yours are, you can see how it can make you more resilient, more effective. But also, you know, one of the big questions is how do you avoid falling off, the, you know, derailing yourself with your yeah. career by being, maybe you talked a bit about brand, and you, but you can become known for the wrong things as well, can't you, with, with this? Yeah. yeah, you can. And that, I mean, coming back to strengths and overdrive, it often is, particularly as you progress through your career, it's, it's the greatest um, management and leadership risk of all is the strength and overdrive that's left unchecked, unexplored, and where you perhaps haven't had sufficient feedback or, or, or asked for sufficient feedback uh, from other people um, yeah. as to areas where they feel that you, you might be in overdrive. You know, They know, but you often don't know as a leader because what's worked up to now has got you to a point of leadership and management. And actually, why wouldn't you just carry on doing more of that and actually even louder? Doesn't it make sense to turn it up a little bit more because you're in a leader now? So, you know, and, and that, the answer is mm -hmm. probably that's the last thing you want to do. What you really want to do now is start to be more curious, um, adopt more of a, a kind of humble approach where you're uh, switching on even more to learning uh, and becoming more situationally flexible and situationally agile. So, um, so actually to avoid falling off the rails, it is important to recognise which strengths you have that can go into overdrive and if there are any draining areas. I mentioned my efficiency being essentially, from a strengths point of view, non-existent. Um, so it doesn't, mean, it doesn't make me inefficient though. I just need to have a strategy to deal with that. That effectively is a hole in the boat for me. But if I remember to respect people who bring that planfulness, that ability to bring efficiency to projects, and if I call on those people in order to make sure that you know, things happen, things do happen on time, and if I remember to call on other strengths in order for me to get to meetings on time, and for me, I call on my relational strengths for that to yeah. happen because it's the relationship that I want to protect and develop rather than the plan that I want to follow, then you know, I'm not going to end up being late. So should we have a look at a, a strength scope wheel and see what's in what? it? Let's do that. You might recognize this one. Oops, too far. There it is. There you go. So, talk, yeah, that, that talk, is, talk that's about what's happening here. Sorry, Francis. No, I said just talk us through what's happening here. Obviously, yes. you've okay, so failed. It is mine. Uh, so, I do recognize it. It is a bit yeah. like looking at a spiky colored mirror version of myself. Um, but, you know, it is, it is me. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the top seven strengths you can see represented here are the top seven in rank order. Um, but what we do is try and encourage people to focus in on perhaps two or three that really define their brand, that really define them at their best, and that they can spend some developmental time um, growing and improving. Um, and for me, those would be collaboration, empathy, and leading. And they're the ones that I spend most time on. I'm also conscious of, uh, you know, the overdrive risks that I, that I face with each of those. And actually, sometimes underdrive, you know, this is a less well-explored concept, but, you know, not necessarily feeling that I can always get to some of these strengths because of situations. And sort of, you know, knocking those, those challenges out of the way to ensure that I do. Sometimes my strengths might get in the way of me using other strengths, uh, for example. So, you know, that, you, what you can see in the wheel then is 24 strengths, four clusters, uh, top seven, what we call bubbling unders as well, that are those that almost sit below the surface and give you options when you need them. And then drainers, which are the, the ones that are much lower, which for me are effectively the project management strengths of efficiency and results focus. And detail orientation is in that group as well, a bit higher for me, but still by no means a strength area. Yeah. Interesting. So, so let's look at it from a, a team perspective because we did this with with my team, um, and it was it was fascinating because I, a couple of things happened. One is um, my bottom right hand corner looks very similar to yours, <laughs> uh, which, which was interesting. But fortunately, there are people in the team who who fall into that. So number one was yes, everyone on the call knows that you would then play to the strengths. But the point I'd make is you don't dump it on these people. 
that's Absolutely. the trouble. They become the kind of workhorse of something, or the, or the yeah, just give it to them, give it to them, and it's that just doesn't feel good or right, does it? No, uh, no, particularly um, if they're in the minority. So if you've got a, a particular team and you've maybe got one person, maybe two people who are known for particular strengths and qualities that they can bring, um, it can feel quite risky for those people to step up and say, well, let me do that thing. Because what they may learn is that although everyone says that they respect um, those strengths and that they want that, actually, they, people don't have that lens to look through. You know, the rest of the team are, are saying, well, I, yeah, I know we need it, but I don't really value it. You know, yeah. and for those people, they could end up feeling in the minority, which is definitely um, the case, yeah. almost to the point of, of, of feeling sort of um, suppressed or even oppressed by the rest of the team. So there's, a, there's an important set of habits and disciplines and behaviours to develop as a team if you want to get the best from your strengths. And that's definitely one of them. It's always remember, if you've got one person with a strength in the team, you've got that strength represented, but you, you're going to need to have um, an approach to take to ensure that, that the, the voice of that person remains just as loud as everybody else when it comes to using their strength effectively. And, and then the other thing that really surprised me was and it just shows how we need sometimes to take time out and, and to look again because I was delighted to see some of the purple strengths if you like that some some of the people have in the team that I probably wasn't that consciously aware of if at all and yeah. and you know and instead of sitting there thinking why can't somebody do this now I know that somebody can and gets energy from it and enjoys it and it gives them a chance to 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 be energized and prove something you know yeah, yeah exactly exactly that i mean it's important that we recognize that you know everyone's going to have elements of their job role that they're not necessarily going to naturally enjoy so yeah. having certain strengths and not having others doesn't excuse you from the parts of your role your job that um you know that you do find draining but it gives you choices it gives you options in two ways one you can choose to use certain strengths in order to get those less energizing parts of your role done and two you can have a conversation with a colleague and find out you know if they've got natural energy for those things can they at least support you with that as a task rather yeah. than you always feeling that you've got to you know draw everything from within you in order to get yeah. get things done well i t i took uh we're going to move quickly into questions but i took uh i've got strategic mindedness common sense and developing others oddly enough a, a purple for me and I had a problem recently well, last week and actually ran it through the filter of how can I use those strengths to help me with that problem and it and it really did shift that mindset um, to a point where actually I've, I've, I felt so calm and it felt very natural when I did the things that I decided to do so, so I think it's a, a great concept and a great, a great. Well, it's not even a concept, a great approach. Um, so, thank you for that. We've got a few questions have come in. Uh, do you mind if I uh, kick off with okay. one? It's, yeah, it's a classic that I know. There's somebody who thinks, right, I want to use this in an organisation, but I'm going to bang into finance or bang into somebody who says, well, yeah, what's the point? So, how does this approach benefit businesses? Yeah, it's a great question and actually i mean we've we've written a whole business case on this um and it tends to be <clears throat> both at an organizational level and at an individual level there are really significant positive outcomes that you see you know there's in positive psychology you have um a discipline which is not yet 20 years old re realistically or it's around 20 years old so the research uh, the body of work that's been done around research is less well established than it is for broader psychology however there is a growing amount of literature there's a growing amount of research that is showing us that you absolutely get better business outcomes as an organization and for individuals if you adopt the strengths approach so if people are playing to strengths uh, they're more likely to see higher levels of self-confidence improved relationships uh, they're going to be more satisfied at work and we think the reason for that is that people expect to be understood and appreciated these days of work. So the employee experience, particularly for millennials, um, Gen Zers, even more so, 
there's an expectation that you know these people have grown up with technology essentially giving them exactly what they want when they want it so why when they go get a job is it not the same there you know it should be that their role and that their experience of work is individuated to them and increasingly technology is enabling that to be the case but if you're not understanding your employees because you don't understand their strengths and what they can best be used you're going to come up short and people are going to be asking that question well why wouldn't i go and work for someone who does understand me because you know uh, there are other people who are you know who, who are using those and i know now is not the time you know to be no. saying things like that because it's a difficult but you know i think people now they're looking for meaning they're looking for um yeah. purpose in, in the roles that they take and they're looking to be understood um so you know for that reason alone uh yeah, i think it's uh um yeah i mean it's, it's it's a it's a very important part of the answer the second part is around organizational benefits and actually seeing improvements in the bottom line the top line levels of attrition levels of absence and that that is almost taking that first point and expanding it out to the whole uh, culture of, of, of the place that you're working within um, it makes entirely makes sense if an organization is knowing where to deploy people to the best of their um, you know sort of strength set then they're creating better project teams um, or project teams who are better able to deliver to deliver um, the right outcomes the right goals for, for that particular part of the organization and if it's a positive productive uh inclusive place to work you're going to feel a greater sense of belonging you're going to like working where you work you're more likely to be productive so you do see these outcomes i mean gallup have done quite a bit of research uh, across the world looking at organizational outcomes and some of this we've written up in our in our business case but it's relatively easy to find online as well um you know and and you do see some really significant shifts i think some of their early work it it, it looked a little bit um difficult to swallow it was almost so good i think what yeah. you see now yeah. in their work is it, it's very much more realistic you might see a five percent improvement in attrition rate you might see a seven percent improvement in sales um, and that it feels more credible i think for that yeah. yeah okay and i don't think it's just the gen zs who want to have meaning and feel included and all you know it's like fantastic when that when when you go down that no. I, I agree, and I think maybe it's the Gen Zs and the Millennials who've um, who've enabled that conversation, or almost facilitated that conversation, and now everyone else is in there too, going, "Absolutely, I just wish yes. I was great right about that <laughs> 25 years ago." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to wind the clock back a little bit, but um, okay. Another question, and I think this somebody's kind of linking it back to the British Psychological Society accreditations. But is there like a, a benchmark? So if I did my team. Could I compare that with teams in other companies or 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 set of norms or something? Or is there any value in doing that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good, it's a good question. So with Strengthscope, it is normed. So uh, when someone completes Strengthscope, their responses are compared against a global working population norm in order for the profile to be generated. But what we find is what's most important is almost irrespective of whether you have a a flat profile that's kind of more clustered towards the middle or a, a sunburst type of a profile. I mean, if you look at mine uh, on the screen, it is almost a sun, I don't even know what that is, like a sunrise, possibly, or a sunset, I don't know. But anyway, it's quite spiky. You know, you've got highs in there, you've got lows in there. Some people, it's more clustered towards the middle. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, you almost create your own norm. Uh, yeah. The high points and the low points within a profile are the most important thing to, to explore and to understand even if there's not a lot of difference between those those high points and low points so in answer to your question we run team profiles we run group profiles and whole organization profiles by summing the top seven of each of the people uh, who've completed the profile right. you know rather than looking at the numeric scores uh, overall yeah. because that's that's the most important thing of all yeah. and i would you know i always guard against you know comparing too much within an industry or within a country or whatever because and the view is uh, i've heard this you know said by many statisticians potentially all you do is end up saying well we're better than you know, yeah. you know that's know. not the point it's not the point of the strengths approach the strengths approach is about you owning recognizing and owning that you have certain unique qualities your team may have certain unique qualities how can you get more from those um there are differences in the way that the profiles are generated but those differences tend to be by 
discipline. Um, you know, so you might see a different profile for a marketing team versus a production team, for example, um, possibly by different industry. You know, you see differences as well. Great. OK, well, we have slightly overrun in terms of uh, where we've gone, but we just have two or three minutes left. I um, Please stay stay on. I just want to talk about our offer and our, our free gifts. But first of all, I just want to say a massive thank you to you, Paul. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed your energy. Great insight. Uh, for me, the big thing is how can I use my strengths in this situation to, to make things better for me, my business and my people? And, um, and that's massively oversimplifying the gems of information you've given us today. So thank you very, very much. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, here's a very quick offer. So uh, as a special offer for people who've come on, on this webinar, um, everything is done through distance. We're very experienced at it. We've been doing distance uh, virtual classrooms for quite some time. So we have a two and a half hour virtual classroom learning by all around Brazil building resilience. Um, we add to that learning sprints around how to manage your emotions through difficult times. Our, our sprints are pure digital with um, a small amount of human interaction and a massive amount of transfer to the workplace. Uh, they're self-directed and they're personalized. So the person gets to choose which path they follow. So they could use their personal strengths to, uh, to drive them there. And of course, part of that is each participant will get their own unique strength scope report. And thank you to Paul for including that. So that's at a 30% discount. Um, if you're interested, please contact us through Hello at Sagos and we'll get that all set up for you. Um, and I just want to thank you for joining and to tell you that over the next few days, there will be a goodie bag coming into your inbox. Um, I won't tell you what's in it, uh, but there's valuable stuff from today's um, session, plus additional stuff that we've provided. Um, the one thing I didn't say at the beginning that I really should have done is that Paul is a star blogger. He's known as the strengths guy. Uh, and I really, really recommend that you, you uh, follow his um, podcasts and blogs on, on, on there. So you can get them by going to the Strength Scope site. We will also send you a link because there's a very uh, relevant one coming out early next week. Uh, that aligns directly to the subject that we've been listening to today. So thank you all very much. It's been an absolute pleasure being with you today. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you.